Scott and Jason. Excellent work. Thank you very much. Good day here at Hartford Christian Church, as I know all of you are aware. Um, I just got going over some of this stuff. I'm going to go over it again. I'm going to let you know. It's going to be a busy week, in fact. Uh, on Tuesday, me and Scott are going to go up and hand out candy to the Wayland Elementary School kids. They come through uh, town up here. We'll be up in front of Tara's uh, office, uh, like we are every year, hand out candy to the kids. Looking forward to that. Five o'clock on Tuesday night, Halloween night. If you want to go trick or treating with the preachers, we're going to meet in this parking lot at five o'clock. All right, here's our plan. We're going to go up Old Main Street. We're going to go to Cliff and Cindy's house. I know I didn't tell you about this until right now, but I also know that you're expecting this. All right, okay. Then we're going to come over to Bobby's house. And again, Bobby has no idea until right now. Where I'm going to have parked the church van. Right? And then we'll drive back here to get to your car. So last year we kind of got a little carried away. <laughs> we were trick-or-treating for like four hours. This year we kind of got a better plan. So that's that's the plan. Come out and, uh, if you want to. Come out and um, go up and down the streets with us. Always good fellowship and honestly good outreach. See a lot of folks in the community there. Um, tonight... If you can help, 2.30, set up. The bouncy house guys are going to be here between 1 and 2. And as soon as we get those bouncy set up, we'll know where to set up everything else. So 2.30, set up, and bring your chili here by 3.30, please, because that's when we want to start judging, so that we can have the chili out at 4 o'clock for the community to eat. Just in case you didn't know, I didn't announce this this year yet, until now. But here are my... Four confirmed judges, Scott Evans, wave your hand, all right, Sarah Chen, and Chris and Eli Hayes, they're not here with us this morning, but I guarantee they'll be here at 3.30 for the chili. Uh, so looking forward to that, and of course, I will have to be a judge myself, as always, for the Mikey's Choice Award. Looking forward to that. Now, some of you all have said, it's cold. <coughs> Thank you, Captain Obvious. <laughs> Wear a hoodie, okay? Listen, this is going to be mostly outside. If we have to make arrangements and if there's uh, extenuating circumstances, uh, we'll move some stuff inside. But right now we're going to have some tables set up inside in case anybody wants to eat inside where it's a little bit warmer. But this is a big event. Now, I have no idea. We might have 20 people show up. But I have a sneaking suspicion we might have over 500 show up. Okay? Just <laughs> sneaking. Listen, last year we had about 500 people show up for it. This year we've even promoted it even bigger. We've had signs up. We've been on the radio station. We've been in the newspaper. Folks, this could be a huge event for our church. Yeah, maybe it falls flat. Maybe we have 30 people show up. Uh, I'd guess a lot more than that. So what do we want to do? We want to be outside. We want to have the table set up. We want to have smiles on our faces. We want to set the example. No problem. Smiles, not frowns. Don't do that. <laughs> we want to be welcoming to our community. And with every opportunity that you might have that presents itself in the the church. What are we trying to do? Set the example for Christ. Set the example of love. We're trying to let everybody know that we are here to serve our community. And the best way that we know how to serve our community is to tell people about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Seriously, like that's all? Like, let's try that again because this is too important for me here. Amen. <laughs> the best thing we can do for our community is to tell them about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's more like it. Okay, see, because today is a, just like any other day of every year, of every week, of every month. That's our responsibility. We've got to tell them an action. We've got to tell them an attitude. We've got to tell them behavior. And we most certainly got to tell them by our word of mouth. That's the step of faith that we plan on taking today. And the step of faith that we should take every single day. It's kind of like the step of faith that Martin Luther took 500 years ago. What we now know as Reformation Day. And we'll, say, we'll talk about this Reformation today as well. October 31st, 1517. Give or take. Uh, there's variances on that date. That's the day that Martin Luther, uh, because of indulgences, and I'm not even going to get into what all that was, but basically it was uh, another way other than Jesus Christ to, for forgiveness of sins. Some of you had to do about paying money and so on and so forth. But he had these issues that the church at the time um, was doing, and he gave the 95 reasons, the 95 theses. He sent it to the Pope, who was his boss at the time, 
and he went and posted it on the church door. This is what you would do. Okay? If there was a, it's kind of like our bulletin board back here where it says community events. That was kind of like the church door back in the day if you had some kind of event. So, for example, if uh, we still did things the way they did back in 1517 in Germany, you would find an advertisement for our church fall festival on the church door. Now, we might tape one up there. Shoot, there might be one taped up there now. But we're not going to nail it because the door is glass, of course. Martin Luther. Here's the first quote I want to use from him today. And a little hard to read. He said, Unless I am convinced by proofs from Scripture or by plain and clear reasons and arguments, I can and will not retract, for it is neither safe nor wise to do anything against conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. So what is he saying here? He's saying, I want to do what the Scripture says to do. What the Scripture says to do. Not what the Pope or the Bishop or any other church leader says to do, but what the Word of God says to do. And upon his um, study and learning and deep, deep, deep uh, meditation and prayer about what the Scriptures actually say, Martin Luther took a stand and started what we now know as the Reformation Movement. Now, us being a Christian church, we, we can trace our roots back to this, for sure. But we want to trace our roots back even deeper than Martin Luther in that day when he started to reform the church. That's why in the Christian church we consider ourselves to be part of the Restoration Movement. Not Reformation Movement, but the Restoration Movement. See, we don't want to reform the church. There's no reason to reform the church. Instead, what we want to do, exactly the same kind of mindset that Martin Luther had, we want to restore the church to what the Bible says. Not reform what man has said, but instead restore the New Testament church. The restoration. See, that's the kind of thing that we have really when we look to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He restores our soul. He restores us and justifies us as righteous, declaring us righteous through His blood, through His atoning sacrifice. That's exactly what we want to do with our own lives and it's what we want to do with the church. Restore it to what the Scripture actually says. Not what the opinion of the preacher is and not what the opinion of a great writer is but instead, what the opinion of God is. Because, folks, that's what matters. As we go forward, though, in our restoration movement, if you will, I think it's important to know that any kind of uh, movement based on Scripture, any kind of church, any kind of faith that we have, it starts with us as individuals. So what are we going to do as individuals? Well, I think it kind of comes down to some of the things that Martin Luther did as well. We've got to post it. We've got to make it known. Uh, he posted his 95 Theses, and we've got to be able to not necessarily go and post our grievances with the church on the church wall. Please do not do that. In fact, I would prefer not to come in tomorrow morning or Tuesday morning and find a big list of things that says, here's the seven things that Ryan Childers thinks wrong with the church. Right? Don't do that, Ryan. I pick on him a lot, I know, and it's not going to stop. <laughs> But what are we going to do when we post it? We're going to make a public proclamation. We're going to make it known that this is the way we feel. And not about our negatives or about our, the, the, the grievances that we have. We want to make it known about our faith in Jesus. So is your faith evident? That's what I want to ask you today when we talk about posting it. Is your faith evident in your life? I'm talking about every single day. I'm not talking about just right here on church on Sunday mornings. I'm not talking about on Wednesday nights. I'm not talking about when you're around your church friends. I'm talking about every minute of every day is your faith evident. They'll know you're Christians by your love. Isn't that kind of what the scripture's saying in 1 John, like we've been talking about in Sunday school? Uh, David Johnson had a quote this morning. And he's doing home communion. Um, so I figured I'd use this without permission. But uh, he said this morning in less of Sunday school class that we have nothing to profess without Jesus. I thought about that for a second, and I thought, man, that's spot on. We really, we don't have anything to profess without Jesus. But with Jesus, we have a whole bunch to profess, don't we? With Jesus, we have a reason to say we're going to have a fall festival and invite the community in where we can show them an example of love. 
with Jesus, we've got a reason to smile and rejoice and be happy every single day. With Jesus, we've got a reason to tell our friends and our neighbors and shoot even our enemies that we've got a Lord that saves us, that we've got a Jesus that loves us, that we've got a God that loved us so much that he sent his son for you and for me and for them. Boy, they need to know about it. One of the things that Martin Luther really had in his life was, was a, a vast knowledge of Scripture. And upon contemplating a verse in Romans uh, is when he really started to rethink some of the things that ha had been going on in the church that were more unscriptural. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 is the verse that he pinpointed. It says, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. The Jew first and also the Gentile. In verse 17 it says, This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Through faith we have life. Through faith in Jesus Christ we have life. Folks, that's great news. Now let's make sure we understand what faith means. Because when we talk about posting it, we talk about our, our faith that we've got to make evident. Our faith equals living it. It's not just a matter of saying, I believe, but the book of James was going to say, even the demons believe and tremble in terror. Demons believe there's one God. The devil knows that Jesus saves. It doesn't save them, though. That knowledge alone does not save. Faith is much deeper than that. Faith is a way of life. Faith is how we react to each other. It's how we treat each other. It's again our actions and our attitudes and our behaviors. It's in our heart. Folks, we've got to live it. We've got to live it every single day. It's not an option. This is our responsibility. We've got to make it obvious for the whole world to see. Now, maybe we could say that obvious faith from the church door to social media, we've got to post it. Make a post on social media. We see it all the time. And I'm saying, from the church doors today to when you go home and you get on your computer, is your faith evident? When people talk about you, are they going to say, man, this person really was a political genius or thought they were? Or are they going to say, this person loved the Lord? When, when people talk about you, uh, on the day that you die, are they going to say, man, this guy must have been the biggest Cubs fan ever? They might. But I also hope that they say, but even more importantly than that, he loved the Lord. See, we have our identities and we have who we are, and that's absolutely fine, we should. But along with that identity, whatever it may be, as a Christian, the most important thing that someone can say about you is that you knew Jesus. Amen. And you knew Jesus. On the day that I die, I hope that two things are said about me. He loved the Lord, number one. Number two, he loved his family. And there's a third thing I want it to be, man, he really loved the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> because after those first two things, what's it matter? What's it matter? Let's make our faith obvious. Let's make it obvious today at our fall festival. Let's make it obvious tomorrow at our jobs, at our schools, at our homes. Let's make it obvious every single day. And how are we going to make sure we do this? How are we going to make sure that we really live our faith? We've got to know that we feel safe in our faith. We've got to have that fortification, if you will. Let's fortify it. Let's fortify what we know about God. Has anybody ever made a fort like this or a tent fort or a blanket fort in your living room? Now, I know all parents ever, always... We, we have. We have. And all kids have at some point. My dad made really, really good ones back in the day. He'd make my mom so aggravated because he'd take her, her brand new uh, vacuum cleaner and he'd take the cord and he'd use it, you know, to kind of hold the blankets up and tie it up real tight. And, uh, mom never did like that too much, but when dad saw the look on our faces and the smiles that we had and the safety that we felt in that blanket for it, he didn't seem to care. See, because when you're in that blanket for it, that, that, that cushion for it, uh, no, this is not me, by the way. This is just a picture off the internet. Uh, but when you're in that, what do you feel? You feel safe. 
Nothing can touch me there. And really, it's no different than any other day when you might have been sitting on that couch, but for some reason, you feel safe. Folks, that's what we've got to have in our, in our faith lives, in our Christian walk, on that path of righteousness, that feeling of safety. <clears throat> Martin Luther knew that when he wrote the song, Almighty Fortress. Now, some of the words might have seemed a little strange when we sang that song. You have to remember something. Martin Luther was German. So this song was translated into English by someone else hundreds of years later. I think they did a pretty good job. I think it's a good song. Uh, but what, what did Martin Luther, what, what was he contemplating the day that he wrote the song, A Mighty Fortress? You see it up there on the screen, Psalm 46. Here's just a little bit of it. And you all, I've used this verse before because it's good. I, I love this. It says, God is our refuge and strength. Always ready to help in times of trouble or in ever-present help in times of trouble. I bust down to verse 10. You guys should know these. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the earth. I will be exalted amongst the nations. I will be exalted amongst the earth. Our, our refuge, our strength, our God that is exalted it should be exalted through our lives daily. What a mighty fortress that is. What a mighty fortress our faith can be. Again, I say, that's awesome. And it's all because we believe in the Word of God. The Word of God. Martin Luther said, the Bible is the cradle wherein Christ is laid. Now think about that for a second. Where are you going to find Jesus? There's a few places you can find it. And the first place is the Scripture. The second place is your heart. Because you've learned about the Scripture. You find it in our salvation. And most certainly you should be able to find it through our lives. See, Martin Luther really felt that it was important that people should be able to read the Bible and see what it actually says. To see what it says. What the Word of God is instead of what the Word of a church leader, maybe even a church leader hundreds of years ago. So you know what Martin Luther did? He translated the Bible from Latin and Greek to German. He was one of the first, maybe the first, to ever do that. To ever make it so it was readable for others. It would be a hundred years later before King James would commission some men to do that into English. Or we get our King James Version. Where people can read what the Word of God actually says. Think about that for a second. Because traditions are fine and dandy, but if it's not in the Word of God, it can go. It can change. This is our second annual fall festival. And in 10 years from now, if we're having our 10th annual, or I guess it would be 12th annual fall festival, and we say, you know what, this isn't working, this isn't a good way to reach the community anymore, that can change. Traditions can change. The Word of God we must stand firm on, and it does not change. Amen. So what do we have to do then? We've got to learn it. That's what we've got to do. We've got to live our faith, and we've got to learn the Word of God. Do you know the Word of God? Are you studying it? I think we've had a really deep, in-depth study of Romans going on for about a year now. And it's going to continue out through the rest of the year. Uh, come. I promise you it's going to be some deep stuff. We'll go through it together. I've enjoyed it, and I hope that you that have come have as well. But that's not the only place we should go. We should also go into our homes with the Word of God. We've got to learn it, and we've got to live it, and we've got to do that every single day. Psalm 44 tells us what we should be seeking in our lives. We sang a song that was based off this earlier as well. 44, 42, thank you. 42 verse 1 says, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. As the deer. Yeah, the deer can get thirsty. They're going to long for that stream of water. As much as they want that, we've got to want the word of God even more. Even more. Do you long for God? 
that way. Do you want to know more about Him so you can know Him more in your lives as much as you want to eat chili later tonight? We should. So I'm asking you to do you. If not, it's time for us to surrender. It's time for us to surrender our will to God. It's time for us to realize that we must surrender it all to Him. We must surrender it all to Jesus. Because it's only when we can truly surrender all that we start to understand how important it is to learn it and to live it. I Surrender All, the song we sang earlier, was written by Judson uh, Van de Vintier. And I don't have a picture of him up for this week, and that's a tough name to say. But Judson W. Van de Vintier. Van, Van de Vintier. Now listen, this guy uh, was a very talented musician and songwriter. And he came to a crossroads in his life where he knew that either he was going to stay with the ministry and the music ministry that he was doing, or he was going to go on to a probably lucrative career as a musician, as a singer-songwriter. And the day that he really had to make that decision, he was doing another, uh, a revival and uh, being the music minister for this revival. And he realized that this crossroads was now, and he said, you know what, it's time for me to surrender it all. And he wrote this song, I Surrender All. Sometime later, uh, remembering that event in his life. So I have to ask you now, folks, have you surrendered it all? Have you, have you really given all of your heart to Jesus? Have you really given all of you to Jesus? You can look at the story of the rich young ruler, the rich man, from Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 30. I'm going to start down in... Verse 19, why do you call me good? Jesus asked him, only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, I've obeyed all of these commandments since I was young. I pause there for a second because I probably would just venture to guess he failed a time or two. And maybe not with the adultery or the murder, or maybe not even with the stealing, but you mean you've never lied and you've never disrespected your mom and dad. Um, maybe, maybe, but probably he has. He thinks that he hasn't. Verse 22 says, when Jesus heard his answer, he said, there is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Let me pause there again. Have you ever seen an eye of a needle? Have you ever seen a camel? We will have a petting zoo here tonight. There will not be a camel there. Right, camel? No camel? Okay, I didn't think so. But if there was, you would know that a camel cannot go through an eye of a needle. Except for if God wants it to. And then it can. Keep that in mind. Because with God, all things are possible. Which is what Jesus would reply. So I have to ask you, are you giving it all? No, I'm not talking about every last cent in your savings account. That is not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about right here, are you giving it all to Jesus? Tonight at our fall festival, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Christ reaching out to our community. And maybe you're thinking right now, oh, we're just making it so a bunch of kids are having a bunch of fun and having a bunch of chili. Yep. That's exactly what we're doing. And setting the example all the way through. Tonight, if you get cold and you're aggravated about it, don't show it. You can tell me about it on Monday. <laughs> because listen that's not the kind of example we're setting in our community and I promise you I, just as much as any one of you I would put this up I don't like the cold I do not like the cold my family can vouch for me I will have a hoodie on tonight maybe two hoodies I do not like the cold at all and it's usually about this time of the year whenever I ask Amy why didn't we take that church in Florida before we moved to Harvard <laughs> but I know why I know why I love you all. I'm so glad we're here. But I don't like the cold. 
So what do we got to do then? When we surrender it all to Jesus, we must repent and we must obey. And we've got to love it. So we live it, we learn it, and we love it. See, when we repent and we obey God, it's because that's where our desire is. Even if you mess up, our desire is that we don't mess up. We want so badly to obey God in everything that we do. And when we don't, we better be repenting from it. And when we repent, why? It's because we love the Lord. We're thankful. We have gratitude to Him. Folks, we've got to love it tonight. We've got to continue to learn more and more about Jesus. And we've got to continue to set that example by living it. So what do we got to do? Surrender. And remember our goal. Our goal is to follow fish. Are you following Jesus? Are you fishing for men? Here in a minute, we're going to sing the song, Just As I Am. And I, I forgot to write the lady's name down that wrote this song, but she was a woman who struggled with health. And at one point, she wrote this song just as I am because she knew that this is something that she could do and that the Lord was going to take her as much health problems as she was having just as she was. i got good news for you, though. The Lord wants you just as you are as well. Now, that doesn't mean that He wants to continue for us to live in sin. No, He wants us to live on the path of righteousness. No, he wants us to live on the, the side of light. He doesn't want us to, to be uh, bogged down by darkness and by hate. He wants us to live in righteous love that lights up the world. But today, he's ready for you to come to him just as you are. You don't have to fix anything first. You don't, you don't have to uh, make everything right in your life before you submit to Jesus. Because if you're waiting for that day, that day will never come. It won't. What he wants you to do is submit to him today, just as you are. And then together, you continue to work. Just as I am, Lord, here I am. Please accept me. Jesus says, just come on. So today, just as we are as a church family, we will serve our community. Just as we are as a church family, we will set that example to the best of our ability. Lord, we come. Would you please bow with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your word, for giving us the ability to live it, for allowing us to surrender to you the love that you give us. Lord, I ask that you will help us today and every day to stand strong in your word, to set that example for you. Follow. Lord, I ask that you will help us tonight at our fall festival. Lord, we want to set that example for our community. We want to outreach here so that others may know you and that they may see you through us. Lord, we ask that this will be a successful night. And Lord, we know that that success might not be based on how many people show up but instead on how many people say that's a church that really loves Jesus. Lord, help us to be known as people that love you. That's our desire. Lord, thank you so very much for the sacrifice that you gave us in your son, Jesus. That's why it's in his most precious name we now pray. In the most awesome name of Jesus. Amen. Would you all please stand? We're going to have our hymn of opportunity. I say, why not make today the day to surrender it all to Christ? Come down the aisle as we sing, if...